All right, the Spirit and the cross, the work of the Holy Spirit in the process of salvation, that's our lesson, lesson number four, the function of the Holy Spirit. And we begin with a review. We've noted two views concerning the relationship of the Godhead or the Trinity. I use those terms you know, interchangeably. First is the Godward view, meaning within the Godhead. Within the Godhead, all persons of the Godhead are similar in character, power, revelation. Each are revealed to be equally divine. That's the relationship within the Godhead. Then we talked about the manward relationship or the manward manifestation, their appearance to man, mankind. And we said that after the fall of mankind into sin, each person in the Godhead has taken a different function in accomplishing the plan to save mankind from the condemnation due to sin of which all humans are guilty and stand condemned. So each person in the Godhead is doing something different in relationship to man in the, in the pursuit of salvation. So if there is a difference between the persons in the Godhead, it is due to function and not nature. In other words, if you see a difference between them, it's the difference between the things that they're doing in accomplishing salvation and not a difference in who they are or their power or their abilities. For example, if one does not know something like Jesus, he said he did not know the, the end time, Matthew 24, 36, it was because he in his role or function as the son chose not to know. Uh, if the son submits to the father in the function of the sacrifice sent by the father, it is a submission motivated by love and humility, not submission done because of inferiority. He submits to the father, not because he's inferior to the father, he submits to the father out of love, love for us and love for uh, the father. So God the son is love in that he submits to God the Father's will in order to carry out the plan to save mankind. Now we've also said that our study of the Holy Spirit is centered around the idea of how he functions in relationship to the others in the Trinity in accomplishing the plan of salvation. In other words, our study is what, what's the Holy Spirit doing you know, to accomplish the plan of salvation? We've already established that the Holy Spirit is God. Uh, now we need to study how he functions towards man in the completion of the plan of salvation. So we said, the father, what did he do? He chose the plan. What is the plan of salvation? Well, vicarious atonement, that's the plan. Remember I said, uh, if the Godhead were speaking, how are we going to save mankind? What are we going to do? Well, well, why not just a blanket forgiveness? You know, forget about it. Just forgive everybody. You know, everybody gets in. Well, that doesn't work because it doesn't satisfy the justice required for the evil that men have done. Or nobody gets in. Forget. Let's just forget about them. Just let them live and die and rot in the grave. You know, we'll just go on to something else. Well, that doesn't satisfy God's need for love. You know, so what plan did they come up with? Well, the plan that the father chose was vicarious atonement, the death of the innocent to save the guilty. All right. What else did the father do? Well, he sent the son. He chose the son in order to complete the plan. And so we've noted that this is what the father has done. What has the son done? Well, he has revealed the plan to mankind, came on earth as a man, and as a man speaking to other human beings, he revealed God's plan. That's one of the things that he did. And then he fulfilled the plan. The vicarious atonement was him. He was the atonement. He was the one who offered uh, his perfect life as an atonement for sin. So we can say the father chose the plan, sent the son. The son revealed the plan, fulfilled the plan. 
Now we're at the Holy Spirit. In our lesson today, we're going to review the Holy Spirit's function in carrying out God's plan of salvation. Now before we do that, however, we need to keep in mind that although each person in the Godhead seems to have a different function, all three act in a seamless unity without anyone functioning independently from the others. For example, the Father chose the plan, but the Holy Spirit and the Son both know and agree to the plan. And the Father sent the Son, and the Son came forth through the miraculous birth empowered by the Holy Spirit. So you know, they're all working uh, together seamlessly to accomplish this plan. So here's a summary of human history from God's perspective. God has essentially two goals to accomplish in all of history. Two goals that determine man's place in eternity. The rest of the events of history are just wallpaper. Wallpaper. The Romans, the Greeks, the Persians, they're wallpaper. They're in service of God's two main goals. Goal number one, execute the plan of salvation, which is vicarious atonement. Uh, and execute that plan in real time, which would be the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So let's read some passages that talk about this. Romans 16, 25 and six. Paul writes, now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, the revealing of the plan there, according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past. What's the mystery? Well, the plan, vicarious atonement. That's, the, that, that's what's been kept secret for long ages past. But now is manifested. The plan is now revealed, right, through Christ. And by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandments of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations. The prophets spoke of it. The prophets said, you know, one day this is going to happen. Isaiah in particular, okay? The prophets spoke and now it says that plan has been made known to all nations. Why? Well, Jesus came and Jesus died and Jesus resurrected and now the apostles have gone out and they've, they've proclaimed this plan that God has to save all of mankind. And then it says, leading to the obedience of faith. Well, what are the apostles doing? They're telling people how they can take advantage of this plan. Okay. And then in 1 Timothy, chapter two, verses three to six, it says, this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, God the Father, God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. What's the truth? Well, the plan, the vicarious atonement. God wants everybody to know about that truth. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony given at the proper time. Again, Paul is saying that the Father wants everybody to know the plan and the plan is being revealed through Christ and through the apostles. So that's goal number one. Goal number two is the glorification and the exaltation of the church that belongs to Christ at his return. That's goal number two. We read, these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. These, when he says these, he meant, he talks before uh, the disobedient ones, the, the evil ones, the ones that refuse to believe the gospel. These people, he say, they're going to pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed for our testimony to you was believed, the glorification and the exaltation of the church that belongs to Christ. And this will be done at his return. And won't it be marvelous, he says, be marveled at for all who believe. 
So from God's perspective, the first and the second coming of Jesus are the high points in all of human history. All events work in conjunction with these two, whether we realize it or not. Now, how the Holy Spirit functions or is active in accomplishing these two goals is the context of our study today. We get to know Him, the Holy Spirit, by studying what He has done to bring about the completion of these two goals, the cross of Christ, the glory of the church. Of course, the Holy Spirit may have been active in other ways, but we're going to examine only the information revealed to us in the Bible. So the Holy Spirit's activity in the Old Testament worked primarily towards the Father's first goal, which is what? The plan of salvation, that's his first goal. So we read in Galatians 4.4, but when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. So in his function during the Old Testament period, the, whole, the Holy Spirit was primarily involved in two spheres of activity. Okay, first, the creation itself. In order for Jesus to come, there had to be a world created, and here's the point, and sustained. Created and sustained. The Holy Spirit was active in the initial creation before the fall of man. We read that in Genesis 1 verse 2, the earth was formless and void and the darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was moving. Again, the Hebrew word there, vibrating over the surface of the water, the idea uh, being that the Holy Spirit brings into view the formation of the creation uh, from what God has uh, initially uh, created. The Holy Spirit was also active after uh, the fall of man, sustaining and maintaining a fallen creation that would continue to support fallen mankind. Once man falls, once the creation is corrupted, it continues to be corrupted until it completely you know, falls apart. The work of the Holy Spirit is to sustain the creation so that the first goal you know, can be accomplished, can be achieved. So he was active after the fall of man, sustaining and maintaining a fallen creation that would continue to support a fallen mankind until the Savior came. We read little snips of this in the Old Testament. In one Psalm, in particular Psalm 104, we read, O Lord, how many are your works? In wisdom you have made them all. The earth is full of your possessions. There is the sea, great and broad, in which are swarms without number, animals, both small and great, there the ships move along and Leviathan, which you have formed to sport in it, they all wait for you to give them their food in due season. You give it to them, they gather it up. You open your hand, they are satisfied with good. You hide your face, they are dismayed. You take away their spirit, they expire and return to their dust. You send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. And so this intervention by God, the Holy Spirit, was especially needed after the complete destruction of the world by the great flood caused by man's sinfulness. Man's sinfulness causes the great flood. Think about it, everything is destroyed. Everything is destroyed. You know, you have one little tiny flood in a city or something, it, you know, it takes them years to, to kind of get back to normal. And this is with you know, machinery and equipment and people from other places coming to build and so on and so forth. You know, what if you're eight people and the whole thing has been destroyed? Who helps you? Who restores you know, the earth? Well, the Holy Spirit restores the earth so that it is uh, habitable uh, in, by, uh, by man, by weakened man. 
So the Holy Spirit sustains a fallen world inhabited by a majority of fallen people so that the Father's two main goals can be accomplished. Remember it said at the right time. Well, the right time wasn't a day after Noah you know, comes out of the boat. You know, the right time would be you know, th a thousand years uh, ahead of time. Uh, thousands of years into the future. And so how is the world sustained? How are human beings sustained? The animals and everything else sustained until that time? Well, the Holy Spirit is what David writes about here. So there's the Spirit's function in creation and in post-creation viability to serve God's plan as well as his function regarding a second area of his work, the Holy Spirit's work, and that is the nation of Israel. And so I go back just so that we can keep the package together here. The Holy Spirit in the Old Testament, how does he work? A, at the creation itself. B, maintaining mankind and the creation after the fall. C, through the nation of Israel. In order for Jesus to enter the physical world as a man, he needed a human, social, cultural, and religious identity. You know, was Jesus going to be born Polish? <laughs> uh, you know, was he going to be born a, a Macedonian, a Greek? You know, was God going to just pick some nation that existed and some pagan nation and say, okay, you're going to be one of those guys. No. Beginning with one man, Abram, who he renamed Abraham, a man who lived in the Mesopotamian capital of Ur, which is modern day Iraq, God formed out of this one man a family, then tribes, and then finally a nation with its own history and culture and laws and religion. These were known as Jewish people, the Jews. And they were given the land of Israel as their home. In other words, God formed a unique nation with its only purpose to be a historical stage upon which Jesus would enter the world. That was their purpose. He picked one man and out of that one man, he made a nation. And we read about that in the Old Testament, right? We read about how the nations were formed. We read about how the family was formed and the children they had and then the, a tribe and how they moved and how the, there were 12 tribes and you know, uh, their history. And then they were given a laws to follow and then they were given a religion to practice. And then finally they were given a place to live, you know, which was their own land, the promised land. And all of that history and all of that culture was given to them through the agency of the Holy Spirit's work with that nation. So according to God's plan, goal number one, Jesus would come to earth and enter human history on the stage of the Jewish nation and the Holy Spirit was at work forming that nation throughout the centuries. Now the Jewish nation would be the channel through which Christ would come in order to complete goal number one, vicarious atonement. And he would do this through his death and burial and res resurrection. As I mentioned before, Vicarious atonement means the innocent knowingly paying a debt owed by the guilty. That was the plan. Now, being Jewish didn't automatically save you, although they, with time, they began to think that that was how they were saved. You know, I'm culturally a Jew, therefore I'm good. There's nothing else I need to do, I'm, I'm safe. Actually being Jewish meant that God would offer salvation to the world through someone from your nation. 
That's what it meant. And would offer salvation to you first because of your special role in history. We note that the Bible is silent on the Holy Spirit's direct activity with the development of the chosen people. The interaction is largely between the father and the patriarchs as God the father calls and chooses Abraham and his various descendants, Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses and Joshua and so on and so forth. Those people interacted with the father, if you notice. However, once the nation was being formed, the Holy Spirit is seen as the source of the extraordinary and supernatural powers which allowed certain ones to experience and exercise the following. They experienced and exercised leadership through the power of the Holy Spirit, the Jewish nation I'm talking about. When I say leadership, I mean wisdom and courage and knowledge. A couple of passages to demonstrate that. Moses, for example, and the 70 elders in Numbers 11, it says, the Lord therefore said to Moses, gather for me 70 men from the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and their officers, and bring them to the tent of meeting and let them take their stand there with you. Then I will come down and speak with you there and I will take of the spirit who is upon you and I will put him upon them and they shall bear the burden of the people with you so that you will not bear it all alone. Another example, Joshua, Numbers 27, it says, so the Lord said to Moses, take Joshua the son of Nun, a man in whom is the spirit and lay your hand on him. Joshua, a great military leader, had the spirit in him to direct him and to strengthen him. I'm not, I'm not giving you the entire list, I'm just taking a couple of examples. Samson, one of the judges, right? It says, then the woman gave birth to a son and named him Samson, and the child grew up and the Lord blessed him and the spirit of the Lord began to stir him in uh, Mahana Dan between Zorah and Eshtaol. The spirit stirred him and we know of the, you know, the works of Samson, great physical strength, right? Well, who, who gave him that? Did he get that because he worked out at the gym? No, the spirit gave him the, the strength to do what he did. Any movie you ever see about Samson, he looks like a guy who you know, competes in the uh, Mr. World competition, you know? but uh, it wouldn't, be, wouldn't we be surprised if we actually saw Samson and he looked pretty much like any one of us? And the incredible strength and power that he had had nothing to do with muscle, but had everything to do with the power of the spirit that was on him and in him for his work. Um, what about Saul? He was a leader. It says, then the spirit of the Lord will come upon you mightily and you shall prophesy with them and you'll be changed into another man. This is Saul, the first king of Israel when he first began and he obeyed God at the beginning. The spirit was on him and gave him wisdom and he won, he had victories, he had early victories in his, uh, the beginning of his reign. Why? because the spirit was on him. And then of course, in the Old Testament, David, if we're talking about leaders, says then Samuel took uh, the horn of oil and anointed him, meaning David, in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward and Samuel arose and went to Ramah. So the lesson to these people about the Holy Spirit was that no man was worthy of leadership unless he was led by the Holy Spirit. All of the leaders of Israel, the prophets of Israel, the Spirit is the one who gave them the strength, the wisdom, the ability to prophecy, to do miracles and so on and so forth. So you're saying, how did the Holy Spirit work with the nation of Israel? Well, he empowered its leaders to do the work uh, of leading uh, and preserving 
the Jewish nation because if it wasn't for these leaders, those guys would have fallen apart, right? I mean, they were continually going back into idolatry. They were getting into wars that they shouldn't be getting into and so on and so forth. And so uh, the nation was preserved by the spirit uh, through his interaction with uh, their leaders. Another way that the Holy Spirit uh, empowered or interacted with the Jewish nation, and it was with their workers, uh, giving them extraordinary ability. We read in ex Exodus 31. Now, um, uh, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, see, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with the spirit of God in wisdom and in understanding and knowledge and in all kinds of craftsmanship to make artistic designs for work in gold and silver and in bronze and in the cutting of stones for settings and in the carving of wood that he may work in all kinds of craftsmanship. Uh, those who ha have different trades, you know, do they just one day say, I think I'm going to be a carpenter and go to a Home Depot and get themselves tools and no, it takes years and years of you know, apprenticeship to learn to be a carpenter or to learn to be an electrician or to learn, you know, all of the trades require years of training. Well, out in the desert, there was no training and they had to build this magnificent, you know, tabernacle, very intricate, very, you know, delicate, very difficult. And so the Holy Spirit empowered the tradesmen so that they could work at a level, you know, that was required by God. And so the Holy Spirit was working even with the tradesmen. He also worked with the prophets, those who spoke to the people in behalf of God and those who spoke of the things that would take place in the future. Of course, the Holy Spirit provided accurate oral records for the creation, for early human history, for moral laws, and then predictions of Jesus' coming and the work that he would do. For example, Moses uh, in Numbers 11, it says, then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and he took of the spirit who was upon him and placed him upon the 70 elders. And when the spirit rested upon them, they prophesied, but they did not uh, do it again. Uh, there's an example of Moses and the 70, uh, uh, you know, good men to begin with, but with the spirit, they became powerful men, powerful leaders of the nation. Uh, another kind of example is Balaam. Uh, Balaam was no Moses <laughs> in, in Numbers 24, 12, uh, 24, 2 rather, it says, and Balaam lifted up his eyes and saw Israel camping tribe by tribe and the spirit of God came upon him. Here's a good example of one who was not among God's people, but uh, uh, used by the spirit to accomplish God's purpose especially to show how the spirit is not limited. So the spirit was not limited to working only with God's people. He also worked with others in, in the service to God's uh, people. Uh, he even worked with a donkey, right? Remember that story? Uh, a donkey spoke to the prophet, uh, warning him uh, you know, that what he was doing was dangerous, would, would lead to his death. So the Spirit of God can you know, work with, it, with anything. We also look at uh, David, of course. It says, now these are the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse declares, the man who was raised on high declares, the anointed of God of Jacob and the sweet psalmist of Israel. And what did David say? The Spirit of the Lord spoke by me and his word was on my tongue. So David himself knew that he was speaking God's word by the power of God. It's not he was speaking and then he died and after he died, people say, you know what? The things that David wrote, they must have been from God. David knew he was speaking on behalf of God. He knew that the spirit 
was upon him. Isaiah, one other example. Isaiah says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. This is Isaiah also saying that he knows that what he is saying, he is saying through the power of the Spirit of God. The Old Testament did not deal with the question of the manner of indwelling, but rather with the very real fact that certain things were done by the power of the Holy Spirit, which could not be done in any other way. So the Holy Spirit's work in the Old Testament period draws to a close and the first of the Father's goals is within view as we look at how he uh, operated in the personal leading, in the period rather, leading up to and including the life of God the Son, Jesus Christ. So I said, God the Father's got two goals, vicarious atonement, the glorification of the church, the Holy Spirit worked in the Old Testament with the leaders and the workmen and the prophecy and so on and so forth, uh, and also the sustainability of the world to keep it together until this vicarious atonement could be accomplished. So now the Holy Spirit's work before and during the life of Jesus. The activity of the Holy Spirit is seen more before and after Jesus' life than during it. While Jesus is on the earth, he is the dynamic presence of the Godhead active among men. The Trinity works in unison, but is most often revealed individually. In the Old Testament, we see more of the Father working with, speaking to, interacting with people. In the gospel period, it's God the Son that we see. We hear the Father and we, we're aware of the Spirit, but the person who's on stage, who's there, is the Son, Jesus. He's the one we see. And then after what we call the church age, you know, Acts and forward, is the time of the Holy Spirit. We see very much the work of the Holy Spirit during that period, even until uh, today, all right? So the work of the Holy Spirit before the birth of Jesus. What did he do? Well, first he sends John the Baptist, right? Luke 1 says, but the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you will give him the name John. Elizabeth and Zacharias, he was a priest. They were very advanced in age, beyond childbearing age, and they wanted a son, they wanted a child. And miraculously, were given a, a, a child. And this is the angel telling Zacharias that his wife would have a, a child and they were to name him John. It says, you will have joy and gladness and many will rejoice at his birth for he will be great in the sight of the Lord and he will drink no wine or liquor and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. So the Holy Spirit working before Christ comes, how? Uh, with the coming of uh, John the Baptist. God's first goal is announced and becomes into view uh, uh, through the work of the Spirit. It says here, it is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah. They're talking about John the Baptist and what he would do to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready people prepared for the Lord. And so the Holy Spirit is working in John the Baptist and John the Baptist is preparing the way for the Lord. Who's going to do what? Who's going to accomplish goal number one, okay? And then we see again the Holy Spirit with Mary as she conceives. The angel answered and said to her, Mary, uh, you know, she's asking him, how am I going to have a child? I'm, I'm, I'm a virgin. I plan to stay one until I get married. How will I have a child? And so the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. 
And for that reason, the Holy Child shall be called the Son of God. And so again, all of this is preparation. Sends John the Baptist, uh, gives John the Baptist his message. Now Mary uh, conceives. The work of the Holy Spirit continues in the life of Jesus himself in his baptism. It says, then Jesus arrived from Galilee at the Jordan coming to John to be baptized by him. But John tried to prevent him saying, I have need to be baptized by you and do you come to me? But Jesus answering said to him, permit it at this time for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he uh, permitted him. After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water and behold, the heavens were open and he saw the spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. And behold, a voice out of the heavens said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. This was Jesus's anointing. You know, when David was anointed, you know, you're going to be the king by Samuel. Was he the king right away? Did right away, did he go up to Jerusalem and sit on the throne? No, no, he was chased around by Saul for years and years and he hid out and you know, there was a long period between his anointing and his actual, you know, seating as the king. Well, this is the anointing of Jesus as the Messiah and, 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 and the, the, uh, an early revelation from God about who he was and what he would eventually do. But did he do it right away? Oh no, several years went by, right? Several years went by before he uh, accomplished this vicarious, uh, vicarious uh, atonement. However, Jesus' anointing was different, of course, in many ways than David's. He fulfilled all of the Old Testament prefigurements of the one to come. No other person and this is important. No other person in the Bible was ever anointed as king, prophet, and priest all at the same time. They anointed some king, but a king couldn't be a priest. They anointed some as priests, but priests weren't allowed to be kings. And they anointed some as prophets who could neither be kings or priests. But when they anointed Jesus, when, they, when I say they, I don't mean the, the human priests. I mean when they, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, when they anointed Jesus uh, on that day, they anointed him as uh, king and prophet and priest. Also, all three persons in the Godhead or of the Trinity are manifested at the same time and in the same place. That's very rare. Uh, it's the only time that it happens. So the Father speaks, the Son is present in Jesus, and the Holy Spirit appears as a dove. And so for the purpose of our study, the Holy Spirit is present at the anointing of Jesus where his ministry begins. Now, we also have the work of the Holy Spirit because that's our lesson today. You know? How's the Holy Spirit? What's he do? Well, the work of the Holy Spirit in the ministry of Jesus. It says in Luke 4 verse 1, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness. So Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was both indwelled and empowered by the Holy Spirit, okay? This is seen in both his holy, pious, and faithful life, as well as the miraculous power that he displayed. We also have the work of the Holy Spirit in the death of Jesus. In John 19, 30, it says, therefore, when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Jesus offers his perfect life in payment for the sins of humanity and does so on a stage of human history prepared and sustained by the Holy Spirit for this purpose. And then we see the work of the Holy Spirit in the resurrection of Jesus. In Romans 8, 11, it says, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, meaning you, the Christian, 
He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. That is such an encouraging passage that Paul says, if the spirit that was in Jesus and that raised him up from the dead, if that spirit is the spirit that's in you, then he's going to do the same thing for you that he did for Jesus. You know, one of the reasons, they, you know, why should I be baptized? Because when you're baptized, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, what good is that? <laughs> that's the power that's going to raise you up on the last day. That's what's good about that, among, among other things. And then of course, uh, the resurrection of Jesus powered by the Holy Spirit confirms the legitimacy of God's first goal and all the teaching of Jesus that comes before it and after it through the apostles. One other scripture here. He says, concerning his son who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. How do you know Jesus is the Son of God? How do you know Jesus is the Messiah? How do you know Jesus is divine? Well, because His resurrection is the confirmation of all these things and His resurrection is powered uh, uh, by the Holy Spirit. All right, so let's finish up, summarize quickly. So the activity of the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament had as its purpose the setting of the stage so that God's first goal could be reached and could be revealed. And that is, of course, the cross of Jesus, including his death, his burial, and of course, his resurrection. We read in Hebrews chapter 10, verse one, for the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of these things, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, make perfect those who draw near. When we study the Bible, beginning with the Old Testament, what we see is the shadow before we actually see the object or the action or the person causing the shadow. The Old Testament is the shadow. The New Testament is the reality, okay? So the kings and the prophets and the priests and their work, they were only shadows of Christ and his work. The Jews failed to understand things. They didn't understand, they thought that was it. They thought that was the substance. The Jewish nation was only a shadow of what God ultimately desired. And what was that? A glorious kingdom or church sanctified by the blood of Christ, not the blood of animals. And then thirdly, the great temple with its elaborate sacrificial system was only a preview of the present sacrifice to come. So Jesus' atoning death was to be the supreme act of love and worship since it contained a perfect demonstration of God's love for man, his redemption from sin and condemnation and death. So the cross, the vicarious atonement, was also a perfect demonstration of man's love for God. Jesus, the man, obeyed God unto death. And finally, it was a perfect demonstration of man's love for other men. Jesus, the innocent man, giving his life for his enemies who were guilty of sin. Those, therefore, who desire to worship in spirit and truth must do so in light of the cross of Jesus Christ, because it is worship directed by the Holy Spirit, it is worship based on truth, and it is worship made possible by the combined efforts and manifestation of the complete Godhead, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, all of them working together to bring about goal number one vicarious atonement through which all of us here today have been saved. Okay, next time we get together, we are going to talk about how the Holy Spirit works to accomplish goal number two, and that is 
the glorification and the exaltation of the church. We are dismissed for today. Thank you.